Gents, I just want to pause the episode for a moment to let you know about the Strong Men of Value Academy. You will have heard me refer to it a number of times and I want to bring more attention to it. So this isn't just a program. It's a life-changing environment and community of men who are focused on personal and professional growth. We're looking at areas of relationships, wealth and health, things to help you thrive and maximize your life. Imagine having bi-monthly one-on-one coaching sessions with myself, weekly group coaching calls, and an incredible brotherhood of high achievers by your side. Now we're diving into resilience, leadership, and holistic growth to not just succeed in your career, but to thrive in your health and your relationships. Your journey to greatness, it starts here. So join the movement and you can apply for the Strong Men of Value Academy. You can head to the manthatcanproject.com to find out more. You're listening to The Man That Can Project with Lockie Stewart, a global movement created to empower men and open up what's really going through their minds by having real and raw conversations about life's unique challenges and our individual ways of processing it all. Welcome to The Man That Can Project. team welcome back to another episode of the man at cam project podcast this episode is exciting and uh well for two reasons because it's really a take two um we george the guest uh myself we did a uh facebook live together probably about a month ago maybe maybe a bit more five weeks yeah. uh in the man at cam project facebook group just to uh share sort of your story because i think it's a it's an incredible story and sort of where you're at now and a few things that you learned along the way uh and i was sitting there i felt like i was being coached mate you were the (laughs) for me you know i was fortunate we were fortunate fortunate to connect via the good old instagram uh i think yeah it was instagram yeah and it was instagram yeah and um hit it off straight away mate like you're such a good genuine bloke and I always say I only work with people that I'd have a beer with, mate. I'd have plenty of beers with you. I know that. <laughs> so, <Quite minded. laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred uh, percent. But to to see how much you've, or to, first and foremost, to learn learn about you as a as an individual, but then also to see you, um, you know, put the hand up and reach out, saying, "Hey, I'm ready to to improve some aspects of myself and you've gone ahead and done that and now you're bloody thriving mate or you already were but now you've sort of gone to that next level is has been very inspiring for myself to watch and you know, i'm looking forward to when you make that trip out to australia or you know i'll be i know i'll be over in the uk and um, we'll make that happen and that's another cool crazy thing about social media guys george is based over in the uk uh it looks quite lush where he is in one video you posted you're out in the farm mate yeah Attic and clear blue skies which is probably random right for the uk yeah there's thunderstorms today mate so uh <laughs> yeah, that's more that's more traditional <laughs> no. yeah yeah but uh mate I'll, I'll i'll pass it over to you i could talk all day about how uh, inspiring and empowering you are as a as an individual and you know, to be fair i'm really excited to to see where this conversation goes because we haven't planned anything we're just going to get you to start no. with Lori and Breathe, see what because it's always good to to have the guest lead the conversation around where where it's going to go. So over to you, my dude. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I sort of like left this completely open minded um, to sort of see where it goes. But um, I think like the the biggest thing that I'll start on is uh, maybe why I was stuck um, or, or why it was uncovered that I was stuck. So hopefully people can relate to that. Um, I mean, there's a few reasons, really. Um, I had problems in my in my childhood when I was younger, um, with um, a, a small period of sexual abuse from from somebody outside the family. Um, that was bottled up for 20 years. Uh, I mean, I was a child, you know, didn't know that was right. Um, that sort of like ruined my childhood, and and a lot of my family, my parents split up a couple of years later. So it was all sort of just put on that, that it was the parent separation and which was hard as well. Don't get me wrong. And that's, you know, a whole, whole nother kettle of fish. And then leaving school, didn't know what to do. I was a bit rebellious, didn't really listen to anybody. So then ended up joining the, um, the infantry. Um, and then went to Afghanistan 2009 Had a really bad time out there, 18 years old. 
um, came back. And so at this point, nobody knows about any of my problems. Um, I've been out here, the British Army, just, you know, as soon as you want out, that's it. You know, there's no aftercare, there's no nothing. So you get left in this bubble. You haven't dealt, or I personally hadn't dealt with anything in my past. I couldn't deal with what was going on right then. So hid behind alcohol and drugs, basically, for four or five years, probably five, six nights a week, just running away, escaping, because that was easier than facing, um, dealing with it. And accept, I, I think acceptance is the key word, because um, accepting what's happened to us, whatever that may be, is the first step of, of recovery. And if something's really, really wrong and something's not your fault, sometimes you feel you shouldn't accept that it's happened to you. Um, but until you have accepted that and accepting it isn't accepting that it's your fault. Oh, you know, it was me that happened to me. Accepting it is saying, you know, something happened that was, was out of the ordinary, that was wrong. Um, you know, we can't put ourselves in scenarios that we talk about sometimes because you just feel it isn't real. Um, so for me, drugs and alcohol was a way of running away from the acceptance of, of what had happened in my life. Um, but then on the flip side of that, I started becoming a nasty person because I became drugs and alcohol. I became disrespectful because, uh, I mean, at the front of that, I had no respect for myself. And that's, that's like the biggest thing is running away and doing that. You, you know, you don't think you're hurting anyone by doing that, but actually you've got your family that love you, friends that love you and, you know, you show no respect for them. You've got no respect for yourself. You, you know, I think we've all been there. I've been in positions where you don't care for your life. Um, you know, I've tried to take take my own life on a couple of occasions. And, you know, thankfully, now that I'm sat here now in the place that I'm in, you know, God, I'm thankful that didn't that didn't work, you know, because it, it's 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 not worth it. But the harsh reality is that a lot of us have been in that situation where that feels like the best option and it doesn't feel like there's other options um open and and anywhere which is is really hard um so there's like so if you think now i don't know what am i 20 23 years old now at this point um all this has happened and you know unfortunately like from the outside i had a great childhood great upbringing and but people didn't know what was really going on inside. So this is this this front that we all have of that we seem to hide behind. Um, and we do a very good job at it. And people see that then as you know, this is this is that person, this is this is who they are. Um, and then there's the acceptance point of view when people start liking you. Like I spent so many years of my life being the clown, being being the drug addict, you know, oh, you know let's invite George to the party here, turn up, here, turn up with this, here, turn up with that. Um, which, which I did. And I always delivered what people wanted, um, which was, you know, a clown, which was drunk George, funny George, ruthless George, um, which, you know, don't get me wrong. I like having a good time. I like having a party, but I hated it. I hated that the only way that I felt accepted was to turn up and like damage my own health for the benefit of somebody else laughing. <laughs> and do you feel you know, you you felt like you only felt accepted, or that was really the the only way you accepted yourself at that point in time? Yeah, I think I think a big big part of that was accepting yourself. Um, and I mean it's. At the, at the time you feel that you're appeasing others and you know certainly some people you were appeasing by doing that um and then people shouldn't be in your life frankly um and the people that were actually stood by you and it, it was it, you know it's clear that you were just doing it to make yourself feel more accepted then people are still there now and then people will stand by you and they stand by you because they know that isn't you they know that that's a front and um 
you know, then I've still got a lot of people still in my life today, which I, I sit there and question. I go, you know, why are you still here? Like, I treated you like dirt. Mm. You know, and it's it's really clear and evident that they they can see the other side of you. They can see the vulnerable side. They can they can see your pain and and your hurting. And um, I don't think they always understand why you why you do things. Um, and I think a lot of us don't understand ourselves sometimes why why we do actions that we do. Um, I mean, my life started changing when I, I know we spoke about this in the Facebook Live, when I when I met my partner. Um, and I did get it wrong. It was quite funny. I laughed about this the other day. In the Facebook Live, I, I said that I'd been with, uh, with Lauren six and a half years. And if I get that wrong, she'll kill me. It's been five and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was picked up on. So that was, uh, that was good to get that wrong. So five and a half years ago when I, when I met Lauren, um, she was the first person that I'd been with that like fully accepted me for who I was and still at the start didn't really understand my full vulnerable self but um, I think it was like two years in she was the first person that I told um, about you know early on in my childhood um, and that was like really strange for me because it was like that was the first time I felt vulnerable since that happened when I was a child because i had been hiding something my whole life from the age of eight to the age of 24 25 i'd been hiding something from everybody and what, dealing with it myself. can i ask what made you feel like she was the right person to tell that or what what was yeah what sort of went through your mind where you're like yeah i feel like i can finally talk about this um i felt like um Growing up after that happened, I had huge trust issues because I, you know, you don't know something's wrong, but you do know it's wrong. Yeah. But then you feel that, you know, your parents at the time or whoever have left you in this vulnerable position, even though they didn't know that they had left you in a vulnerable, vulnerable position, you start blaming people. Yeah. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I doing this? And it's not their fault at all. Um, but you, you blame people and then you lose trust. Mm. And when that trust is then broken down, to be vulnerable to somebody that you've got trust issues with is iron impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in essence, it sounds really sad, but she was the first person in, in my life when that happened that I felt fully trustworthy with, that I felt in that moment, it was like one o'clock in the morning or something. I just like woke up and started crying. She's like, what's wrong? I blurted it out and she sat there like fuck like you know it, it wasn't even like um a planned conversation or anything it was just like a connection that had got to a point where it's like i need to share my problems with this person um, how, how, did, how did you feel after that like after just blurting it out terrified why why terrified because there was a chance that now more people in the world would know. And, what, and, and why was that a bad, like in, in your mind, why, why was that a bad thing for you? Judgment? Yep. Um, I didn't want, I didn't want this, this sympathy or anything like this, but what I wanted to do was deal with it. Um, but I didn't want the reaction from people i didn't want to be you know i was an ex-military man I, you know i didn't want to be looked after i didn't want to you know i, I could deal with this i could deal with it on my own which i bloody couldn't you know but in my mindset at that time yeah it was yeah. you know i don't need anyone else to deal with any of my problems i can deal with this you know um i've done this i've done that open air and actually i needed more help than probably anybody did <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> But I, I was I was terrified of being vulnerable, um, because I thought people accepted me, and I was accepted as this, you know, as I said, you know, the, the guy who turned up with a bag of drugs, the guy, you know, that would drink for two, three days straight, and you know, not think about any consequences, and um, I'd built this persona which was completely fake. And I was scared of losing it because I felt accepted. 
Mm. That's a that's a crazy uh like a a tough situation to be in, right? Like we one of the yeah. biggest things we want as as people is is love, connection, and acceptance. And you you had that, you know, albeit on an identity that you'd built to fit in, but still you you'd had that. So to think about giving yeah. up's a pretty pretty big deal. Yeah, it felt like I was going to lose everything. It, it felt. Um, and that to me at the time, you know, that's, you know, I don't want to be lonely. I, I don't want to not have anyone there. I don't want to walk down the street and be judged. Um, all these things I don't want. Yeah. I, you know, I, you know, I convinced myself that I was happy at that time. And I wasn't. I, I wasn't anywhere close to happy. Like, um, three, four years on, you know, for the first time now. Um, you know, I feel clear, I feel focused, I feel driven, I feel happy, I feel like I can deal with, with anything that that goes in front of me, but dealing with it the right way, not not bottling it up and yeah, that's dealt with. Actually, yeah. no, you just chuck yeah. it to your back of your brain and as soon as any sort of trigger comes, it's all gonna come flooding back. And then instead of just dealing with whatever sets the trigger off, you're dealing with the ten things you've stored in the back of your brain as well. Waterfall. Um it's you know, and I know so many guys that do that now still. And I think it's one of our biggest problems is 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 burying problems, is you know, lifting them out up, swiping them under and leaving them there. But the consequence of doing that is they're not dealt with mm. and they will come back. That's i I agree. I, agree. I, I know a lot of men as well that, that do that and I, I was guilty as as were you as you, you yeah. said you're both guilty of doing that. And that's one thing that I really admire about you. You know, you came on into into our into that group group program, right? And you you were there just going, "Fuck it, here we are. This is me." And you know, you, you I'm sure you did have a heap of fear of judgment and all those sorts of things going through your your head, but you were also yeah. there to to work that out, right? And you was just, yeah. you did what you needed to do to get the result. And a lot of a lot of us are still. Yeah, one I'll throw it out there, mate. That's so much harder. It's so much harder than bottling it up. Oh yeah. It's it's the tough road, mate. It's the tough road. But once 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 you've done it once, um, I remember the first on uh, the breakthrough experience, the, the first live video that we did. Um, fuck, mate. It was terrifying. <laughs> I was like, I, I didn't watch it back for a month. I just posted it. I didn't even watch it back for a full month. I was like, I, I can't even look at it. Um, but it's like the relieving feeling afterwards and, and the empowering feeling um, of, of self-belief. And, you know, it's just, oh, it's incredible, mate. It is, it's the feeling once you've done it is so good, but mate, it took me years to do it. It took me years to be ready and want it enough, I think, in life. And I wish I would have done it earlier. Like, mate, I, I can only, like, imagine my life if i was you know even as young as 15 16 mm. becoming vulnerable trusting people and opening up and you look how different life would be but then also i've learned so much from the many many mistakes i've made in my life um that's been at a cost as well you know i have lost good friendships that meant an awful lot and people stood there um you know i've lost relationships with family members you, you know there's there's so many things that you lose but you've changed now and you can try and make amends but i mean i've learned there's a, there's a couple of things that are too damaged and as long as you learn from that and don't do it again it's you know that's that's enough that's enough for me to move forward yeah 100%. you know um I think that yeah. is as well, like, even though, you know, you've made all these mistakes and some things you've been able to repair and others not so much, but you've now got these understandings and learnings and all that sort of stuff that you can pass on to the, you know, if you have Georgie June or you do have a son, right? You can pass, yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can pass all of this stuff on, right? So they don't have to go through what you went through, which is... If they lift them. But you know, you, you get to start creating that positive ripple effect for 
you know, not only for the next gen, but for even people in your life who've, who've seen how much you've... Uh, yeah, mate, I, I think um, I've actually had, um, not Saturday gone Saturday before, um, I actually had a, he's, um, he's a friend who, who works locally, um, and three o'clock in the morning, he reached out to me, um, basically, basically said he was ready to commit suicide. Um, and I didn't even really see it coming, to be honest. Like, you know, it, it was, it just shows how blind, even with, you know, I've got a huge understanding of suicide and how people are feeling. And that some people's covers are so much. And I got this at three in the morning and, you know, managed to talk to him. Um, and since then, you know, we've got him up to the doctors. We, we've got him help. We've got him talking. Um, and I don't think I would have been able to deal with that even a year ago. Yep. Um, even a year, you know, year, 18 months ago, even though I'd been there, even though I've been in that situation, I still feel I would have had that mindset of, you know, come on, mate, don't be stupid. And that's like the worst thing you could say to somebody. <laughs> but that, that's, that's, that's the mindset that we get locked in because that's, you know, growing up, you know, I know you're the same age as me. It is always, you know, men don't show emotion. Men are, men are the strong men of the house. Men are this, men are that. You know, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't be like this, um, which is a total load of crap. Um, you know, <laughs> mate, a strong man is vulnerable. A strong man is caring. A strong man is loving. Like, a strong man is compassionate. You know, it's, it's a strong man is the complete opposite to what society built an image of. Um, that's that's my belief anyway. I don't know. That that's my belief. My belief is, you know, having sympathy, empathy, love. You know, all of them things are, are so much more empowering than not caring about anyone. Um, I agree. With and, you. You know, the conversation I had last Saturday with 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 that guy was, you know, I, I managed to draw it down to that he didn't feel worthy. And then it, it was, and that's like a massive thing for people. Um, and that's a big reason why we all do stupid things to try and, you know, the same reason I took drugs to try and fit in. Oh, I'm worthy of hanging around these people. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm worthy of friendships. I'm worthy of feeling this way. Um, and that's a, what a lot of it possible down to, you know, so our conversation went on to, you know, breaking it down, you know, you're, you are worthy of this. You know, you tell me the reason why. You know, because you can't you can't tell people. If somebody would have told me like a year to two years ago, you're worthy of this because of this. Uh, that's no good to me. You're just saying that. You know, that's how it comes across. You're you're saying that to make my mind think I am. But you start breaking it down. You start um, getting people to talk. You know, you know why why do you think you're worthy of that? You know, what what have you got around you? And start making the mind think about positives um and what people have got because it's so easy to overshadow that with one big negative you know it's easy to go you know i've got nothing because things do seem that bad at times things do seem that overwhelming so it's just little conversations and it's baby steps of of realization um but you do need to understand the principles and, and get things in place and I, I hope by having conversations like this and, you know, I've listened to almost all of your podcasts and every single one of them is empowering in a different way. And everybody's story is very, very different, but they all come back to the same principles. Um, and I don't know, mate, we, we just got to keep doing this. Everybody's got to keep doing this. And I just hope, you know, if one video inspired one person to talk, you know, that's, that's potentially one life saved. It's, it's you know, it is that critical, I think. Um, I think you, yeah, it's. I couldn't agree more. I think it's one of the most underrated ways we can create change in our, you know, communities, environments, uh, anywhere. Really, is the power of peer-to-peer -peer support, right? mate yeah. to mate, brother to sister, whatever it is. It's like often, and I, I don't say this to discredit uh, health professionals or anything like that. I, I think there's always 
a place and a space for that. But one thing, one thing where people often overlook and they go straight to looking for, for professional help is we just don't have the relationships and the connection in our life that we once had. Yeah. It's so easy to get disconnected. And, you know, the moment that you start feeling disconnected, like you were just saying, George, you start focusing on all the reasons why you aren't worthy and why you don't fit in in that group. And then you, you, you start validating that belief about yourself. And then all of a sudden you retract more, you become a homebody. And then, you know, you start feeling the effects of being alone, right? Being lonely. And yeah, that, that snowball effect. And I think we all have our, our role. And this is why I'm a massive believer that we, my opinion, like we get, we, we get busy, right? Life gets busy. You know, you've got a job, a family, all those things happening. And everyone's got various different uh, journeys happening. But like to try and help a million people is a challenging thing. But if you can just say, hey, right, I've got five good mates. And I'm going to touch base with them every week. And, you know, ideally, hopefully they touch base with you every week as well. Then that's a fucking ripple effect. Because if you're, yeah. George, you're talking to five, I'm talking to five, the five people that you're talking to and the five people that I'm talking to are, yeah. are all talking to five. And we just, you know, the fact that I, you call me, George, and you messaged me last week, which made me call Cam, right? And it's yeah, like yeah. all these triggers. Yeah, yeah. And then we go, right, well, I've done, you know, I'm building a, a good solid five relationship as, as a you and I can fit that in and around my life and I can really value that and give it the time that it needs to make you feel heard, make you feel yeah. valued, make you feel worthy. I think, I think a big lesson in that on the, on the, the time scale thing, ever since the, the breakthrough experience, which was it finished five, six weeks ago now? Yep. Yeah, so like ever since then, like I always had, um, I moved away. Um, when my little boy was born to start my life again because my life was just a wreck and you know it was building blocks and you know i've got a lot of friends um that are 130 miles away you know which which isn't the end of the world it's a couple of hour drive mm. um but i always used to think oh you know why does no one seem to bother or and then you start validating yourself in that way well you know they you know they did only want me like that um etc and now there's, I think there's, there's probably four or five people just from that, that group down there. I ring them once a week, mate, just a two minute chat when I'm in, when I'm in the van driving to work. That's so good. And it's, and it's, it's, mate, you, you sat, you sat in a vehicle, you're either going to be listening to the radio, some music, or you can have a yarn with, with, with one of your pals. And instead of sitting there going, you know, I wonder how so-and-so is, are they doing all right? Ask them. Ring them up, <laughs> yeah. ask them how are you doing. It is, but it's, it doesn't. It doesn't seem that simple at the time. Like you sit there racking in your brain, going, "Oh, well, I haven't heard from so and so. I hope they're all right." And then you start going, "Oh, they haven't phoned me, so you know I'm not going to phone them." Yeah. And it's like, yeah. no, people are caught up with their lives. You know, they want to talk to you. Like, just just pick the phone up. Two minutes. Yeah. And you know, and then each person you speak to is like, you just you feel better and better because you know how people you care about are. They know how you are. You know, you go on with your day feeling, you know, really good, like really happy. Um, and, you know, I hope that they're sat there the other end as well. And I've even, you know, had a couple of messages just saying, oh, cheers for ringing, you know, needed a yeah. chat. And it's, and it's like, you know, you didn't know someone needed a chat. You, you just phoned them out and had a chat because you needed one. Yeah, and it, it, you know, you know, it, it's like um, we've all got very similar values. We might deal with them in different ways, um, and well, I say we've all got similar values. Normally, people within our, our our close friendship groups have got the same values, which is which is why you connect and why you bond together um, because you have the same outlooks, and you know, and sometimes you don't have the same outlook, and that's fine because we're all entitled to our own opinions. I mean, you know, we, we, our group of friends avoid politics an awful lot because we all have very different views and, you know, and that's fine. You know, if it's, if it's a true friend and all your other values align other than politics, you know, there's no reason, there's no reason to argue. There's no reason why you can't get on um, because you need to respect opinion because that makes us all different. So, um, yeah, but that, that's so important, mate. I'm glad you touched on that. Just pick the phone up. You know, I, when it was Friday night, wasn't it? I spoke to you Friday. Um, 
speak to Cam, I spoke to Cam on Friday, I spoke to um, James on Friday. Um, you know, it, it's bloody hell. You, you know, I, I've got friends down the road that I speak to once a week and I've got friends in America and Australia now that I speak to once a week. It's cool. And, man. you know, I've never even met you guys, but I have the same chats and, and the same level of connection with you guys uh, uh, across the pond that's you know as deep as meaningful as people that i've known for 15 years and this is what we crave right? and the, the exciting thing for you or the way i uh, the, what's exciting me for you is that uh might not excite you but is that you're now that ripple effect right like <clears throat> you're now the guy who understands how quickly you can connect with people and the power of uh you know great relationships and, and quality communication yeah the impact that 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 not only can have on you as an individual but the people that you uh you know i guess express that to right so the ripple yeah. effect of you know people are going to be walking around your town going mate george isn't they'll walk away from you going that's one of the best conversations i've ever had and you'll be walking away going geez that person talked a lot <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, 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 mate. The art of listening, though, is something I've had to learn. Um, I felt like, you know, especially when I started dealing with all my issues, it was literally like my life has been shit. And then I just like brain dumped my life on people. And that was like my first stage of vulnerability. But then, like, I wouldn't let anybody get any words in Edge Race. And it was like, but I needed that. And there was people that stood there um, took and took it. And so, yeah. And it was, I do that for people now. Like you realised how key listening is. Like if somebody's in a bad place, they don't need you to say anything. They just want to be heard. Yep. You know, you're you're not going to have answers to help people. You you just listening to somebody is going to be the biggest help that you can give the majority of people. Because once they start talking, once they start brain dumping, they start unpicking it themselves. Hundred percent and just being there supporting them knowing that they can sit there for an hour and chew your ear off and you could not say anything and the fact that you're willing to do that for somebody shows them enough that number one they have got someone that they're not lonely that they're worthy of having friends that you know there's, there's just just literally opening your ear even if it's for 10 minutes could show somebody you know that they've they've got five things off their list that they need um and that's so important to do because i know we've had a lot of conversations and a lot of people have asked this of you know i don't know what to do with so and so he's suicidal i don't know what to what to say in this scenario um you know somebody's asking me if it's okay is everything going to be all right can i tell him everything's going to be all right and the answer is you don't have any of them answers but actually that's not what they need what they need is just to be listened to yep. <laughs> it's, um, and it you know it's terrifying sometimes as a friend especially when you haven't seen that somebody's in such a bad place because they've hidden it so well mm. and it doesn't make you a bad friend not seeing it it's you know people's identities that they can create like i created for so many years there'd be people that I haven't seen in six years and they'd expect me to be exactly the same because that's who they think I am. Mm. Because you can convince people that easily that that's who you are. You know, you can get up, you know, you could want to cut yourself every morning or, you know, I had a big period of time where I'd get every, every day that I got in the van or in the car, I'd look at oncoming cars that are driving towards me and or the phone pro thought process the whole way to work would be oh, I'm just going to turn right a little bit and drive into the oncoming car but then you'd pull up at work you'd put a smile on <laughs> you'd get out and you'd go and be a different person and then you'd get back in the car on the way home on your own and do exactly the same and the way that our brains are capable of switching almost from two personalities that easily so that nobody around us can know it's interesting you say that right how, how like, you, you know, you can be driving to work in, you know, in a point where you want to end your life and you're thinking about driving into a car and then when you show up at work, it's like, hey, game face on, I need to now show up how everyone expects me to show up, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. But the interesting thing that stood out for me there was how you could change your state. And I know this is something that we've worked on, right? Um, and obviously, you know, just constantly changing your state and avoiding the reason why you potentially wanted to end your life is not ideal, you know, but if it can help you get to a happier place, awesome. But what maybe a lot of people miss, and I, I'm guilty of it and you were guilty of it for a while, is that if I can change my state and show up how everyone wants me to show up, you know, nine to five, yeah. how about I maintain that state in for an extra 30 minutes and ask myself, what would I need to do to enjoy my drive to work so I don't feel like, you know, what needs to change or you ask yourself a number of questions that, you know, yeah. what, what would I need to learn about myself or like about myself to go, hey, I don't want to drive in that car. Mate, it's, 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 do you know what? I've only just picked it up now that you brought that up, but it's, you, can, you can click so quickly to fit into a scenario. Um, and it, once, once you've understood and asked some questions of what do I need to do to turn up for myself, you know, and it, mate, brainstorming, writing down, journaling is like the absolute key of, you know, what do I want? What do I need? Um, you know, looking at the eight areas uh, the eight key areas you know what what parts of these am i hitting in my life and you know discuss people, don't know, people, don't know, people who don't know what those eight areas are so don't give it away no i'm kidding <laughs> no 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 so it's um like for me it was always i thought i was going to find happiness for all these years in financial stability and in career yeah and over the last four or five years i've actually smashed them two areas but i still i at the end of it i've got you know a lovely house nice car you know anything i could you know i don't go without I, you know if i want something i'll go and buy it which yep. which just sounds arrogant and really shit and it is it is and that's sort of what that can create but the six values that i'm missing out there i i had a shit relationship because i neglected it for work i had bad relationship with family, bad with friends. I um, neglected my physical health, my mental health, my emotional state. And I just completely neglected all of them areas of my life and just con concentrated on, on finance. Got a load of money in the bank and on career. I've got this great career. You know, no one can touch me. I've worked for this. I've created this, you know, which, yeah, I am really proud of but I'm far less proud of neglecting everything else hmm. because now that I've written that down and gone, you know, I can't get all of this from work, but equally I can't get all of it from my partner or from my family. Hmm. So finding that balance has been absolutely critical <laughs> to finding happiness because I'm feeling fulfilled. You know, I, I've got a sense of adventure because I go out and, I, I do a lot of downhill uh, mountain biking. So I've got my sense of adventure I get from there. I've got a really good relationship now with my partner and we, we make sure that we've got time allocated. And that sounds so... It almost sounded like I didn't want to mention it at first because I was like, oh, you know, darling, uh, can we allocate some time this week to spend with each other? And it's like... <laughs> Why are you why are you scheduling me in like like you would work like you know is that all I am is and then but you look at the flip side of you are important to me so I want to make sure we spend time together exactly perspective exactly but you know when I first heard you say that that it was it was something that obviously you do with um, your partner and I was like that sounds a bit shit <laughs> it was it, it was it was like a, oh but that makes her feel good you know was, oh can I schedule you in for a couple of hours but mate since doing that it's so important because it's you know there are no phones there are no distractions you schedule that time in and that you know three four hours a week whatever it may be is more meaningful than you know a month's worth of Oh, should we do this now? You know, or should we do that now? You know, we've got ten minutes spare. Yeah. And that three, four hours and the connection you get in that time is so meaningful that it screams volumes that I'm doing this because I love you, because I want to spend time with you, because of the fact you're so important. Um and just like scheduling bits like that in. So that's I get that. Like family, I've reached out to family. Um 
that I haven't spoken to in years and just had a chat. Um, my emotional health, you know, journal every day, meditate, um, talk, communicate. So my emotional health, my physical health, I must admit, I still need to pick up a little bit, but um, oh, we're doing the house renovation. So every every uh, dying hour at the moment is even spent at work or up at the house organising trades and, and whatever else. But that's that's like my next key goal on, on my path is once we get back in the house is to pick the, the fitness side of it up. Um, you know, we went for a walk for an hour last night um with the dogs and it was just we haven't done it in a couple of weeks yeah. we've just been feeling tired and drained went for a walk for an hour last night you know afterwards just felt great this morning wake up you feel fresher it's it's just so important to really make sure that you're getting what you need and everybody is capable of writing down what they need 100 percent smells like the tea the <laughs> Yeah, everyone's and it's hard. Like we we sat there going around in circles for ages. I actually remember it was Tom's Tom's on the breakthrough experience. I hope he doesn't mind me calling him out. But you, <laughs> you, you like you like you really really dug into him, and um, I can't remember exactly what it was now. But you just kept going, yeah, but why? <laughs> why? And um, I'm sure he will laugh about it. I don't think he would at the time. I think he was like, you know, as as nervous as the rest of us. Yeah. Um, but you know, ten whys later, he then came out with his answer of, "All right, yeah, you know, that's why I'm feeling like that. Mm. That's what I need." And it's just going deep enough down. If you keep asking why, and I do it with myself all the time, like if I'm feeling an emotion that I find a bit strange or weird, why am I feeling like that? And then straight away on paper in front of me, I'll just write things down. And then if I write something down, I'm like, "Yeah, but then why am I feeling like that?" And it, you will always then find the root cause. Mm, 100%. Why you're feeling an emotion. Yeah, exactly. A lot of us don't want to understand that well, or we just give ourselves the first response and go, yep, solved, next. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but we never get to the root cause. And if we don't get to the root cause, we can't deal with the emotion or mm. deal with the reason why the emotion's there. 100%. Um, and so, I want to ask you two questions before we wrap up. Well, the first one's still a part of the, the combo, but you said, obviously, your life is shit, right? You're, you're at a point where you were, um, you know, drinking drugs, all that sort of stuff. And life wasn't going so great for you, but what was the sort of moment? Can you sort of, I'm really curious as well to, to know what was that moment where you're like, right, I'm, I want to change. And then what, what sort of was your, I guess, went through your mind to, to make that happen, if that makes sense. So, you've just done it to me now. So, um, I would say there's, there's been a couple of defining moments through throughout that have enabled me to learn and develop. I don't think it was, it was one situation. Yep. I think there's, there's been different situations that, each one has made me a little bit more committed yeah. to changing and to realization. So the first one for me was um, my son was born. Um, that was seven years ago now. And that made me go, it didn't make me try and fix myself at all, but it was like, I've got to provide now. Mm. So I went back to university and it was career and finance driven because I, I'm now a provider. I've got somebody to care for. I want to be able to care for them. Didn't know really how to care in an emotional way or anything like that. Yeah. But I knew that if I had a financial stability, then in a sense, I could always be there. So that was my first, first point, really. Then I moved down, um, moved in with my mum because I was, I was going to university and whatnot and I couldn't afford my own place. So, Life was life was bad. Um, my son had just been born, so I moved my mum, which, as I say, is in Wiltshire, and instead we live by um, London originally. Yeah. So it's yeah. two and a half hours away from my son, I moved straight away. Um, but looking back, every other weekend I did five-hour round trip. Wow. 
to go and get him every Friday and then Sunday to drop him off. So, you know, I did know how to care. I did know how to be there. But at the time, I didn't see that. It was, you know, I'm moving away just for, for my career and, you know, doing all this. Um, the next stage for me, I was in my deepest point of depression, I think, at that point, because I had taken myself away from my acceptance circle. You know, the drugs weren't there. I was living with my mum. The alcohol wasn't there. And it, I was in a bit of a lockdown situation. So, I mean, there were, there were days... But I'd still switch and go to work. But there were, I'd get home. I'd eat my dinner in my bedroom. I'd shut the door. I wouldn't leave the room at weekends because I was in, in that deeper depression. I couldn't be around people. I, I couldn't, couldn't face the world. But obviously, this finance and career was so important to me. Come Monday morning, it was click of the fingers, get out of bed, go yeah. to work. Um, but then it was probably a year into that. I then met my partner. Um, and I felt like I had, it was really weird because I hadn't really, never had any long-term relationships, anything like that. And my partner um, was actually the wedding singer at my mum's wedding. And she lived, she lived five hours drive away up in Blackpool in Northwest England. And um, I spent the weekend with her at my mum's wedding. And like, we like really connected and, and, we like we just drank so much and just sat chatting until like really early hours of the morning and like just became like fully vulnerable and it was alcohol that did it you know I wouldn't have normally done that it was definitely alcohol um, and the wingman. Then she, I went to work on a Monday morning and she was at university with my stepbrother basically which is why why she came down to sing and all of this sort of stuff that was why there was a singer from all the way up north not you know down the road um but i got back from work monday and i felt like empty i was like shit fuck, what's this feeling you know because women hadn't really been that to me it was you know i think as you know this horrible i do think it's horrible now this lad culture of you know our perception of you know treat them mean bloody keep them keen all the you know all this yeah, yeah, yeah. horrible shit that's you know, that we, you know, at that point, yeah, you know, I thought that was all right for whatever strange reason, and it's simply not. Um, she let, as I said, I got back from work and I felt empty. I was like, shit, what is this feeling? Like, I haven't felt this before. Yeah. Um, and that was, I messaged, in fact, in fact, she pulled me up on this as well. She messaged me first, definitely. Um, and then um, it sort of went from there. But that that was the next point of, you know, this person means a lot. I know who I've become and who I've made myself. I need to get some help to start figuring this out. So I started then seeing a counsellor at that point. Um, and I thought all my issues from then were from the military. Yeah. And I had a really good counsellor. And it soon became apparent that there was so much more. Um, you know, at this point, my counsellor didn't even know about the sexual abuse. All she knew about was a, a, a separation of my parents and the military. You know, so there was still, it wasn't even coming out there. It was like, it was so locked down. It yeah. was, you know. Um, so I saw her for a few years and then it really helped. But then I, I had, I sort of got to a point where I was happy and I just stopped going. And I was like, no, that's it. I'm fixed now. I'm done. I can do all this on my own again. Biggest mistake of my life, mate. Biggest mistake of my life. Things started going downhill with how I was feeling. I started going back to old coping mechanisms of drugs. Um, I then started hurting people around me because I didn't feel deserving. So I wanted to get, I didn't have the guts to have conversations of, you know, I need you to, to be away from me. I'm a horrible person because I knew that they wouldn't go. I knew they'd stand by me. So it was like, right, I'm just going to hurt people because that's going to get them away from me mm. because I'm not deserving of this and not deserving of that. Um, and then I did really hurt people. I hurt my partner. I hurt um, a, lot of, a lot of people around me. Um, and it got to a point where I couldn't cope anymore. So I sat in a lay-by and drank a bottle of bleach. Um, this was well, a year and a half ago now. It's not Christmas gone December before and I went home 
and I was just throwing up all night. I told her I had a stomach bug and I stayed downstairs throwing up all night. Spent it on my own because I still didn't feel deserving of help. And it was like, you know, you idiot, you've done this. There's people that love you around you. That's going to hurt so many people. It hasn't worked. You know, you're pathetic. You're this, you're that. Um, and from waking up the next day, it was, it ended, the hurt, the hurting people ended in an action sense, but I hadn't dealt with my issues still, so I was still taking drugs, um, I was still drinking, and that was still hurting people, but I didn't see that because I wasn't directly hurting people, but it was hurting people who were standing by me, who were supporting me, etc. And then, um, yeah, there was a couple of times that just led to sheer embarrassment. You know, I'd drive home from work, on drugs, you know, how many lives am I putting at risk doing that? Mm. You know, all this sort of stuff. And then, you know, one day it was, you know, I sat down by my partner and, and other family members and it was, this is your last chance. You're going to lose everything. Um, and I was like, shit, these people that have stood by me that have been there are now having a conversation with me saying that they're going. Um, and... I didn't want that anymore. You know, I'd stopped. I thought I'd stopped hurting people, but I was blind to the fact that I was still hurting them. Um, and at that point, that was when just about that time that I found you <laughs> on Instagram. And that, that was the next sort of defining moment of, and that was the first time, like, like with the counsellor, it was, you know, it was understanding your emotion and what you're feeling but it wasn't it wasn't the what are you missing part and I think it was the what are you missing part that was so vital to me and I think to others mm. more than the understanding is just that what's that missing because if you're filling negative voids up with positive ones and positive actions ultimately you know you're always going to get negatives you're always going to get negative thoughts you're always going to wake up some days bad. Um, but then if you can turn that around and go, oh, you know, that makes me feel really good. Um, because it's that, it's that sacrifice. You know, if we're, if we're choosing to, to go out for a walk, we're sacrificing maybe sitting and reading a book or sacrificing watching a TV programme we might like. But what one of them three is going to make you feel better? And it's always choosing that sacrifice of... I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this because this makes me feel like this. 100%. It's just ensuring that that sacrifice is the right sacrifice for you to make. Um, so, yeah, I'd say they're, they're, they're the three defining moments then of what helped me change and push me. So, sunborn, meeting my partner, and then risk of losing absolutely everything that really did mean something to me. And it took, took them three stages over the last seven years me to get where I am so it's definitely an ongoing ongoing battle <laughs> yeah I think there's there's a port uh sorry an important message in that that you know there's no one size fits all approach and there's no you know some people go I should have fucking I should just have fixed myself by now I shouldn't keep making these mistakes and it's not there is no right or wrong right it's it's whenever it clicks for you it clicks for you but just because you keep in my opinion, it's like I fucked up a heap. I would have had yeah. more than three defining moments, but they never really stood out until hindsight, right? Looking yeah. back, I'm like, you're an idiot. How did you not notice that? And I know there's a lot of people out there. And so for you, there was those three prominent ones, and I'm sure there was a lot more. Uh, oh, there's loads and loads of little ones, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and we all should be going, oh, I should have figured it out. But the thing is, we don't have a rule book on how to how to be happy, really. We don't. We, we get taught some systemic thing which i won't go into through school that really just teaches us to be like everyone else and unfortunately if you look at the world around you most people are fucking unhappy and unhealthy yeah, right? yeah. So my way of thinking is be different and do differently and you'll get different results right and if that takes you a while to understand and let it sink in what that is for you not for me or for george but for you then you can start running with it but last yeah, question yeah. george because I know it's nearly 10 a.m. there. It's nearly smoko time. Do you say smoko over there for like morning tea or how do you, how do you? 
No, mate. We do you know what? I don't even think they have elevenses. If you're really, if you're really prim and proper, it's elevenses. But uh, no, mate, just break, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> well, there's, there's a word for you. you. Can take back to the job site, smoko. That's it. Mate, give it to the lads. Tell them I please do that. But uh, what does well? What's your definition of being a man? Oh, Sorry. There you go. <laughs> That's right. Um, My definition of being a man, um, I think I'd start by um, being adaptable to situations to allow vulnerability to flourish in a community. I don't know. I love it. That's how, I don't know, that sounds a bit waffly. I don't know. Um, oh, mate, where can I start? There's, there's, there's so many good bits about being a man, um, but... The key bits to being adaptable and being vulnerable for me because they're things that I haven't had my whole life. So I think everyone's definition is different and everyone's definition is right, um, you know, in their own way. So that's mine. That's mine. <laughs> Nailed it, man. I loved it. Thank you. Well, mate, I appreciate you giving up your morning and uh, sharing all that with me. Right. Or with, not just with me, with, with everyone that... Uh, is a part of the man that can community and everyone that's involved in it. I got a heap out of it. I got a ton of notes, which I'll be putting in the, in the show note episodes, which will be right. cool. Um, so yeah, I appreciate your time, mate. I know you got a lot to do. So mate, once again, thanks for coming. No, good, mate. your experience with us. Yeah, no, brilliant, mate. I would, uh, hopefully we do another one in uh, a few months time and check in, see how people are doing. Adios. All right, Jen. So thank you for tuning into that episode. And I know you would have got a heap of value uh, out of that just like I did. So once again, where to next for those of you who are loving the podcast episodes? The first place to start really is just join our Facebook community. If you haven't, uh, search The Man That Can Project uh, on Facebook and make sure you accept the group. Also like the page if you'd like, but get involved in our community. And from there, you can really find out what some next steps are, how you can get involved and how you can you know, attend one of the workshops or be a part of the, the continual program that's running. So lads, I look forward to uh, meeting you in the future. And once again, if you get value from this, share it from someone who you know needs it. Or you know, I love also seeing uh, when people take that extra 90 seconds to leave a review. So have a great day and thank you again. Thank you for listening to the Man That Can Project podcast. My name is Lockie Stewart. And I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it helpful. If you did, please take a moment to rate and review the Man That Can Project on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with our newest episodes. We'll see you again next time.